in the Christmas messages this morning. It's in Matthew, the first chapter, and it says this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Uriah's wife. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Well, wasn't that exciting? <laughs> it's kind of like reading a phone book, isn't it? I mean, uh, why is it in the Bible? Uh, let me ask you a question. Are you the kind of person that if one thing goes wrong, it kind of ruins the whole event for you? Like if the sweater doesn't fit, does that ruin Christmas? Or if the vegetables are overcooked, does that ruin dinner? Or if you're late, does that ruin the program or the party? For lots of people, that's true. and It's a hard thing for them to get by. Uh, in 1975, uh, there was a very famous concert was given by a jazz uh, musician. Uh, his name was uh, Keith Jarrett. And uh, uh, there were 1,400 people that were showing up at a venue for his piano solo concert. And he got there about three hours before the event and walked onto dis on the stage to discover that the piano was unplayable. First of all, it was too small for the venue. The sound would not be able to reach to the back of the room. Secondly, the pedals did not work, so you could not make the notes sustain. Thirdly, the keys in the upper register on the higher end, the felt had worn away, so they sound harsh and tinny. Fourthly, the piano was out of tune and last, some of the keys, the black keys, were sticking, and when you played them, they didn't come back up. So he just told me, he said, I can't do this. I, you have to cancel the concert. I don't, I don't, this is not possible. And so the, uh, uh, they tried everything they could. They only had three hours to see if they could get another piano, and they couldn't. So they were able to bring someone in to tune it, but that's the only thing that they could fix. And the young lady who was the promoter for the event was a 17-year-old German young woman, and she begged, pleaded, and implored with Keith Jarrett to please do the concert. And he looked at her and he said, uh, never forget, the only reason I do this is for you. And he asked his producer to record the evening because they wanted to use it as an example for all other promoters. This is what disaster can occur when you don't do it right. And so he sat down and he had to make adjustments because of the piano. So he couldn't play the upper notes because they were too shrill and too harsh. So he kept all of his notes that he was playing in the middle range. And he couldn't use a pedal to sustain uh, the sound, so he had to keep rolling the chords with his left hand. And, and some of the notes stuck, so he had to play in different keys or avoid them altogether. And because the sound wouldn't go to the back of the room, he had to, instead of sitting, he had to stand and pound with all of his might. And in that recording, you can actually hear him moaning throughout the, the performance because he is positive this is going so badly. And that recording wound up being one of his best-selling albums ever. In fact, that recording wound up being one of the best-selling jazz albums ever produced and one of the best-selling solo piano albums ever produced. That night, he did not believe that he could create a masterpiece with a flawed instrument. When you look at the genealogy of Christ, there's a lot of flawed instruments in that line. And it's important that they're there because they teach us some very valuable lessons. And the first is this, is that if you believe God only uses the perfect, then you will never allow him to use you. Because we all know the truth about ourselves. We know we're flawed. We, we know even when we're well-intended, things don't go as we plan, and we're not always well-intended. The second thing that we realize is that you will have an unrealistic view of how God uses others. If someone appears to be being used by God, you might assume that they are perfect. You'll put them up on a pedestal that they can't possibly live up to. 
And thirdly, is that you will be willing to receive what God offers through, or you will not be willing to receive what God offers through imperfect people. When you notice a flaw, you won't receive anything that God would like to release through their lives. This can happen when we have the opinion that in order for God to create a masterpiece, he has to start with a perfect instrument. So, this is what I'd like to look at this day, uh, today in, in related to the uh, genealogy that we just read. In the ancient world, your genealogy was your resume. Uh, if you were born into the right family, uh, doors would open for you. If you were born into the right households, I mean, people in the community automatically had respect. So your resume was just, this is who my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather is. And they would go, well, this is a good family, and they would give you opportunity. If you were born into a questionable family, well, then uh, it wouldn't go quite so well for you, and a lot of doors would be closed. Now, in our resumes today, of course, nobody would ever exaggerate anything on their resume or falsify any information on their resume in order to get their foot in the door, right? That would never happen. Actually, there's been some rather notable cases of that. For those of you who are foodies, you might know that a, a guy by the name of Robert Irvine, who claimed on his resume that he designed the wedding cake for Prince Charles and Princess Diana's wedding. Uh, as it turns out, uh, he did not design that cake. As it turns out, he attended the school that the cake was designed at, which is not quite the same thing. And because it was on his resume that he designed the wedding cake for Prince Charles and Princess Diana, he was given his own television show on the Food Network, which when they discovered that he actually didn't design the cake, they promptly fired him and canceled the show. If you're a Notre Dame fan, you might remember the name George O'Leary. He was the head coach of Notre Dame football for five days, shortest tenure in the history of football. He had falsified on his resume that he actually had a master's degree from an institution and that he had been a star player at another university, and the truth was he didn't have a master's degree from any institution and, in fact, had never played a single game of football in his life. So he was kicked out the door. And then there was one guy, his name was Adam Wheeler. Adam Wheeler lied about his entire academic background just to get accepted into Harvard. He actually fabricated an entire transcript in which he proved, at least on paper, that he had uh, come from MIT and had perfect grades. In fact, he had attended another university and was kicked out for academic dishonesty. Um, when he got into Harvard, he was accepted because they didn't know the deceit. When he got into Harvard, he continued to plagiarize his papers and his essays, and he was awarded an additional $40,000 in gifts and grants by the school. Well, they found out he was charged with 20 misdemeanors and felony counts. He was put on 10 years probation, and he had to pay back over $45,000 to the college. People in the ancient world never would have padded their resumes, right? Well, they did. Just like we would add some people uh, and, and some stories into our resumes to get in the door, there are other people who would claim to be relatives or claim to be connected to people that would get them in the door, and they would forget about the ones that they didn't want to get into the door. And so that's why we're surprised by the genealogy of Jesus. Because in the genealogy of Jesus, there are people listed here that everybody else would leave out of their resume if they were doctoring it. First of all, in the ancient world, it was a patriarchal society. In a patriarchal society, women had no standing at all. They were, not they were never given credit, and they were not considered credible. In fact, in the ancient world, a woman couldn't even testify in a court of law because her testimony was not considered valid. So when you look at the, the ancestry lines in the ancient world, you never see women listed there. And yet there are five women listed in Matthew's account of the genealogy of Jesus. Uh, in addition to that, it would be very important in Jewish culture that you could trace your ancestry back to the original 12 tribes of Israel because that proved that you belonged to that group. And yet there are multiple occasions in the ancestry of Jesus where there are actually Gentiles that are included. And to top it all off, even some of the more notable names that are in that list 
There were scandals associated with those people, and not only does the transcript or the, the lineage include their names, it also gives hints reminding everybody of the scandal. It's astonishing. Let me give you some examples. One of the women listed, her name was Tamar. You might not know the story of Tamar. Her story is told in Genesis, the 38th chapter. She was married to the oldest son of Judah, who was one of the 12 princes of Israel. And so she married him. He was not a very good guy, and he died. And so as was in the custom back then, that wife would be passed on to a brother so that he would be able to have children by her, and that would keep her in the inheritance of the family. Well, that guy refused to have any children by her, and he died. So then she was supposed to go to the third son, and the third son said, she's already been married to two of my brothers, and they both died. I think I'll pass. <laughs> That's enough is enough. And so Judah, the prince of Israel, decided that what they would do is send her back to her father where she would live in her own father's house as a widow. Completely cut her out of the inheritance. And so uh, as time went on, uh, it was time for the uh, shearing of the sheep, which doesn't sound like a big deal to us, but it was a big deal in the ancient world, especially when you had many flocks. And so uh, Judah was going down to a city called Timnah for this big event, and it was not only a lot of work, it was also a lot of celebration. And uh, so Tamar heard about Judah's plan to go to the city, and so she took off her widow's costume, changed her clothes, and hid her face with a veil and went and sat at the city gate, and when Judah, the prince of Israel, arrived, he assumed that she was a prostitute and did not recognize her because her face was covered, and he solicited her. I know. <laughs> it's stunning. And she said, well, what do I, what's my payment for that offer? And he said, I'll give you a young goat from my herd. She says, well, you don't have any young goat with it. He said, I'll send you a goat. She said, how do I know I can trust you? He said, well, here's my staff, and here's my seal, and that's proof that I will bring payment. And so they spent the night together, and she actually became pregnant that night. When the servant came back to make the payment, they couldn't find her. And Judah decided not to pursue it any further because it was already embarrassing to him. And so three months later, he discovered that his former daughter-in-law was pregnant and in his righteous indignation. He called her out in front of the community and demanded that she be burned to death. And along with his demand of the, uh, the loss of her life, he demanded to know who the father was, and she said, the person who owns this seal and this staff. Awkward. <laughs> and she's included in the genealogy of Christ. Or how about Rahab? Rahab's story is told in Joshua chapters 2 and chapter 6. She was also a Gentile, and she lived, she was a citizen of the city of Jericho before the invasion of Israel to go into the promised land. In fact, two men who were spies, they were given the responsibility of, of bringing back military reconnaissance information so that they would be strategic in their assault on the city. And so when they were in there, the leaders of the city became aware that they were being spied on, and they sent out a manhunt to capture these two two spies. And in their trying to flee and escape, they wound up in Rahab's house, and she hid them. She hid them under some stacks of wood on the roof of her house, and then she helped them to escape. And not only did she help them, oh, by the way, in case you don't know what her occupation was, her occupation was a prostitute. She wound up becoming a follower of Jesus or a follower of God. And as a result of being a follower of God, she made this incredible commitment of, of faith uh, to God, a statement that is considered one of the greatest faith statements in all of Scripture. And in fact, in fact, not only is she listed in Joshua's account and in the genealogy of of Jesus, she's also listed among the names of the heroes of the history of faith in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. It's absolutely astonishing, a story about someone who you wouldn't think would belong anywhere. And then there was Ruth, by the way, also a Gentile. She was a Moabite. She had married a young man who also passed away, and she had such a strong loyalty and commitment to her mother-in-law that it's one of the great stories of loyalty in all the world. Imagine that, a story of loyalty to your mother-in-law. In fact, the statement that she makes regarding her mother-in-law was so profound and so deep that it has been repeated at countless weddings since. You probably have heard it. Where you go, I will go. 
where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And in fact, not only is she recorded in the genealogy of Jesus, there's a whole book devoted to her in the Old Testament. And in fact, she goes on to remarry a man by the name of Boaz, and it's one of the great stories of redemption in all of human literature in the genealogy of Jesus. And then there's a woman who is referred to but not named. It says she, the, the mother of Solomon, who had also been Uriah's wife, and her name was Bathsheba. And this was a direct reference and a reminder of an incredible scandal that took place in the administration of King David. King David one night was walking on the roof of his home and saw a beautiful woman that had a neighboring property. She was bathing, and he was smitten with, well, he probably thought it was love. We would probably call it something else. He invited her over to the palace. He seduced her, and he impregnated her. Her husband was in the military and was serving out in battle at that time. David, in order to try to cover up this pregnancy, used all kinds of deception, and when it didn't work, he entered into a conspiracy with the superior officer of Uriah, who was the husband of Bathsheba, and they arranged together and colluded together for his death. David was not only guilty of adultery, he was guilty of murder. And David is included in the genealogy of Jesus, and we are reminded of that story. Why? Why are these things here? Why are they included? Why did the gospel writer include the things most people would leave out? And the first reason is this, is that, uh, I'm sorry, God regularly creates a masterpiece using flawed instruments. God regularly creates a masterpiece using flawed instruments. The first reason is this, it provides genealogical evidence of Jesus' existence. The only reason you would include these names is because they actually were the progenitors of Jesus. If you were just making up a history, you wouldn't include people like this. You would just include the rich and the famous and the well-off and the well-connected and the people who are the heroes of history. You wouldn't add in the scandalous ones. The only reason that they're there is because Jesus actually was born and these actually were his ancestors and that this is not just a fable, it's not just a fairy tale, it's not just a legend, but Jesus actually existed and we have the historical line to substantiate that. The second is, is that it shows us that repentance, not reputation, grants us access to God's family. When you look at the people here that are included in the family of God, it's surprising. God uses People no one else chooses over and over and over again. When you look at the genealogy of Jesus, you don't just see men, you also see women. You don't you just see people with great power, they're included, but you also see the powerless. You don't just see the Jewish individuals, you also see Gentiles. And you don't just see people with royal lineage, you also see people who were common peasants. What this tells us is that anyone, please hear me, anyone can be in the family of God. Everyone can experience the grace of God. It's why we're in the room. Aren't you glad that the grace of God can extend to us? It's good news. The third reason that this gene genealogy exists is because it reminds us that God is not ashamed of us. It doesn't matter where you have come from. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what your history or your past is. God knows this. Grace changes everything. Grace changes everything. God loves you, and he is not relieved if you don't show up. Now, I don't know if your family is like my family, but this happens in a lot of families, all right? You'll have a kind of family gathering, and there are some people, if they don't show up, everybody else in the family is relieved, okay? And if you don't have anybody in, that you can think of in the family like that, it might be you. <laughs> just, just saying, could be, I don't know. Just think about it, all right? But here's what I want you to see. There's absolutely no one, there's absolutely no one that God is relieved if they don't show up. His eyes are always looking for his sons and his daughters. 
because he knows an incredible truth. It's the most astonishing truth that will change our lives. And it's this, his holiness and his righteousness and his goodness is more contagious than our sin and our shame and our guilt. Get around Jesus, get around God, and he transforms your life. That's how it works. And the fourth reason this genealogy is so important is that it reminds you that God uses the gift of time to fulfill his promises. God uses the gift of time. You see, the word that the Bible uses for this is faithfulness. The truth is, is that it took many generations to fulfill the promise that had been given. For to you, a child will be born. To you, a son will be given. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It took generations. In fact, there's, there's 28 generations listed in Matthew. We didn't read all the names, but they're there. It took that long for that promise to come true. When, when the miraculous conception occurred, it still took nine months for the baby, Jesus, to be born. It took him 30 years to prepare for ministry. It took three and a half years for him to accomplish ministry. It took hours for him to die and three days for him to rise again. And this is what I want you to see. Time does not mean that God has forgotten or that God has given up. It is the timing of God that is more important than the time that God takes to fulfill his word. And we get impatient and we assume God have, has abandoned us and he never has. He is fulfilling every promise he has ever made and he will complete every work he has ever began. Now, once you find these hidden presents in the genealogy of Jesus, it actually changes how you see others. You tend not to look down on others because what you realize is, is that we're no better than anybody and no one is better than us, that we're all flawed instruments. But it doesn't stop God from doing a masterful work in our lives. It also helps us to not lose hope because we realize that while it may take time, that the grace of God has an unbelievable influence when we will be patient and allow the faithfulness of God to do his work. And by the way, it also keeps you from misusing or abusing other people because you don't have to use people to get what you want. You recognize that all the best gifts are already freely available because God is recklessly generous in all that he gives to us. Now, here's the thing. God is so good at working his purpose into our messes and into our mess-ups that it is not uncommon for people to actually think that God may have caused the original problem just so that he could show how smart, wise, and powerful he was in fixing it. Here's what I want you to see this morning, is that God is not the author of deception or corruption or decay or disease in our world. These are all the unintended consequences of simple behavior of human beings. It's the side effects that happen when we live in selfish ways. But God does come to us. He walks onto the stage of our lives. And he sees our inability to sustain what is good. And he hears the shrill sounds of our voices. And he sees how some things seem stuck and unusable. And he does not walk off the stage. He sits down. And he begins to play a song of redemption. And it is always a masterpiece in our lives. Let's bow our heads this morning. It is very easy to assume that other people are better, better at life, better at organizing, better at shopping, better at scheduling. And that if God was going to use someone, he would always use the better people. But God doesn't come and choose between those who are good and those who are bad, or those who are gifted and those who seem not to be, or those who just seem to make life work and those who don't. God opens the doors of his family wide 
to anyone, regardless of where we've come from, if we're willing to see him differently and ourselves differently. He has not come to hurt us. He's come to rescue us. He's not offended when he sees us or relieved when he doesn't. His heart is always drawn to us. And he's come today. His purpose has never changed, nor has his motive. He loves us enough to send his one and only son. And his purpose is that we would be part of his family forever. So Father, I ask that you would help us today. Help us understand that you create masterpieces through flawed instruments. In Jesus' name, amen. Just stand with me this morning.